Well, hello everyone. Welcome to Nature Live Online. My name is Alistair. I'm going to be your host for today's show. Thank you very much for joining us. If you've been following Nature Live with the museum the last couple of weeks, uh, thank you for coming back and joining us again. If this is your first time joining us, let me tell you a little bit about what Nature Live Online is all about. Uh, now, if you've ever visited the Natural History Museum in London, you may have gone along to one of our Nature Live talks. They are designed as an opportunity for you to meet some of our scientists. We've got more than 300 scientists that are busy working behind the scenes at the museum and they join us in our bespoke studio to share their research and the specimens that they look after. But uh, of course it won't have uh, missed, no one will have missed the fact that we can't go to the museum today. The museum, like many around the world, is currently closed as the world fights the coronavirus. So instead we've decided to bring Nature Live online from our homes to your homes so that you can meet our scientists and ask questions. So the show is completely live. So if you have any questions at all, please just send them in. We'll try and get through as many of them as we can during the show today. So what are we talking about today? Well, you'll have seen, we're looking at a topic that hit the headlines uh, before the coronavirus kicked off. It was certainly a topic that was at the forefront of a lot of people's minds, and that was plastic pollution. Now, there is almost nowhere on the planet that hasn't suffered from some impact of plastic. It's having a huge effect on our environment uh, and the animals that live there. And some of our scientists at the museum have been exploring this topic and we're going to be finding out a bit more about that today. Uh, one environment that certainly hasn't been immune from this is of course the River Thames here in London. And joining me to talk about uh, this topic, we've got uh, museum PhD student, Alex McGoran. Alex, thank you very much for joining us. How are you today? Hi, I'm good. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for giving up your time and joining us today. Uh, before we dive into the topic properly, can you tell us a little bit about what you actually get up to on a day-to-day -day basis when, you're, when you'd normally be in the museum? So, uh, like you said, I'm a PhD student here at the, uh, well, not here, at the Natural History Museum. <laughs> um, and most of the time is spent with me in the lab, either dissecting fish or thinking about... Uh, dissecting fish uh, and a lot of that is taking out the digestive tract, uh, taking out the gills and looking at how much plastic contaminates these animals. Right so it's it's it sounds like quite it's, it's was this something that you know have you always been kind of worried about the effect of plastic on animals is this something you've, you've kind of always wanted to study or did you come to this sort of more accidentally almost as it were? I think like many people, the impacts of plastic never really sort of occurred to me until it hit the headlines. So when I started this, I was an undergraduate. It was a few years ago now. And I really chose the project because it was fish and I was interested in their anatomy and in understanding the animals. Uh, and this term microplastics that happened to be in the topic really didn't you know, mean anything to me. But having done this research now, obviously, several years it really has caught my interest it really is a topic that I think is important to study and to really find a solution to this if we can. Yeah I think it's definitely a subject that has risen to the forefront of people's minds in the last few years I mean I know I mean I'll be honest for most of my life I've you know obviously used plastic just as much as anyone but I haven't I hadn't really stopped to think about where it was going and what was happening to it and the impact that it might have been having on the environment you know you kind of throw it in the bin and or recycle it and that's the end of it you don't don't really think about it now a lot of people if they're thinking about plastic pollution will certainly perhaps seen uh, images of the effect that the plastic is having on life out at sea uh, where a lot of plastic seems to end up could you just sort of tell us what what kind of impact does plastic have on animals in the ocean so plastic is obviously a really big issue in the ocean. It is absolutely everywhere from the surface water all the way to the deepest parts of the ocean and everywhere in between. And it affects animals at all of those sort of places. Depending on how big it is, it can uh, entangle uh, animals. So carrier bags like these can be ingested by turtles. They can cause them to choke. They can also entangle animals. Um, things like fishing nets that are lost at sea continue to fish. They, they can be having these huge impacts on not only the charismatic megafauna like these turtles, but even to the smallest animals in the ocean, the plankton is affected by plastic. Right. And of course, the, the issue with plastic is that it, it never really goes away, does it? It just it kind of breaks up. So we can see like in the image here, a shard of plastic, maybe from a bag, but it's still having an impact on an animal that comes across it. 
In fact, it's fragmentation. This breaking up is what makes it such a sort of problem for the environment. If it was all really big, it would be much easier for us to see and to, to address. But when it breaks up into these smaller fragments, smaller animals can eat it. And that becomes where the issue sort of really sort of takes off is that animals at all stages of the food chain at all parts of the environment can ingest this and can be affected by it. Um, so even plankton, the smallest animals, you know, to the largest whales are affected by this plastic pollution. Yeah. And I guess from our point of view, you know, most of us probably day to day aren't aren't out at sea. Uh, we're not likely to see images like the one we can see here, but we do encounter a lot of it on places like our beaches, for example. And uh, the tide, of course, bringing in uh, all of this um, rubbish. And that's when it really hits home, I think, for a lot of people is if you go going down to the beach on a on a sunny day uh, and, you know, you're sitting next to a plastic bottle or a carrier bag. Yeah, I mean, the beaches are where it's potentially the easiest to see it and how dramatic and how far reaching an effect it has. Beaches around the world are contaminated. Uh, even on isolated islands, plastic washes ashore. And I think the easiest thing to do is obviously if you find plastic on a beach would be to take it home with you and dispose of it properly. Um, but obviously, as you can see in images like this, the quantity can be so vast and the impact so great that it sometimes feels too hard or too big a problem to tackle um, but obviously every little step we take really helps absolutely yeah I, re I remember watching a, a tv program where they were on a tropical island in the middle of nowhere I think it must have been you know incredibly remote region uh, and it was uninhabited nobody lived there and yet as they were walking around you could see evidence of humans there everywhere it was all of this this plastic rubbish that had just been accumulating in one of the most deserted remote islands you know in the world and i think it really hits home to people uh that, God, this stuff literally gets everywhere um so you're you're particularly interested in um river systems uh, and obviously you're based here in london the river thames is kind of your your research area why if plastic's such a huge issue out in these remote regions why are rivers um a particular sort of focus for your study so there's sort of two reasons for that. And the first and main reason is that 80% of the plastic that we find out in the ocean started its life on land. And that that makes these rivers such an important pathway and mechanism for plastic getting from our cities, from London, for instance, all the way out into the ocean, into places where you wouldn't expect to find it. So understanding plastic here gives us an opportunity to maybe intercept it and to understand the sources. And the second reason is that, as you say, it's it's my back door. It's it's right there. And I think researching plastic, where people see it, where people feel connected to it, really helps sort of push home the message that plastic isn't a problem that's for out there. It's a plastic. It's a problem everywhere. And it's something that because it's right here, right on our doorstep, it is something that we can tackle and something we can change. Yeah, excellent. Well, we've had a couple of questions coming through uh, from viewers. Um, uh, one question here is, uh, does plastic change the pH of the water, making it more or less acidic? That's, that's a good question, actually, because I guess that if it does, that's going to have a quite a knock on effect for animals, isn't it? So it's not a question. I'm not I'm not an expert on the sort of chemicals in plastic. So it's not something that I can necessarily answer per se, but I do know that in several areas, ocean acidification is a big issue. It can affect things like coral bleaching. Um, so I don't know whether the chemicals in plastics can change pH, but obviously it is an issue that, you know, is addressing these oceans and is affecting them. I know that the chemicals in them obviously will change. And I imagine it's a case that potentially polymer by polymer, so whether it's polyester and whether it's nylon and also the chemicals in it will probably impact that so I don't know whether it's a sort of blanket answer that yes they do or no they don't. Mm, I guess it's yeah there's still a more more research ongoing in this kind of stuff isn't there yeah um, another question comes through uh, relating back to the point about you mentioned that all animals are affected how are how are plankton actually affected because obviously these are absolutely tiny organisms. Yeah, so plankton are confirmed to eat plastic, so they definitely do eat these really tiny fragments, often a lot smaller than you'd maybe find in other animals. And that obviously will have an impact where other animals can eat plankton. So there is evidence that fish, for instance, will target 
yellow and blue plastics because they look like plankton. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, if a, plank a plankton has plastic in it, that will transfer potentially to its uh, predator. Depending on the size and the chemicals, these uh, plastics can be lethal. And obviously, any effect at the base of the food web means there's less food higher for higher up and it will have this knock-on impact. Yeah, well, we'll definitely take a look, I think, at that knock-on impact a little bit later on um, when we, we talk about your research. So take us back to the beginning. How did your how did this project actually start? Um, because, you know, as I say, we've we've not really been monitoring plastic pollution for, for that long, really. So how how did we how did it come about that you started looking at plastic in the River Thames specifically? So I think like for many people that research plastic, it's sort of hit us during uh, sort of other research, during our standard research, we saw this and almost changed focus. So the lab at Royal Holloway Natural History Museum initially was looking at an invasive species of crab. So the Chinese mitten crab is incredibly abundant in the Thames. It can be very destructive, but in its native environments in Asia, it can be commercially exploited. You can get up to $40 for mature crab. And so that's an opportunity to potentially deplete this population. So here you can see Dave Pierce, he's a fisherman on the Thames, and he's holding one of the fike nets that the Royal Holloway Natural History Museum labs were using to test the capture of these crabs. Um, but in these nets, it wasn't just these animals that we were catching, it was also huge amounts of plastic. And that's really what sort of changed the course of our research, really. Um, I wouldn't be where I am today if these nets hadn't come up full of plastic. Right. So these, you know, this, these nets were ostensibly looking, you know, you're trying to catch something else for research. And instead, you're getting all of this, this rubbish building up, which mm. immediately starts raising questions. Well, hang on. How much of this stuff is actually in the river? I mean, a river like uh, the Thames, for example, do we have an idea of just how much rubbish is flowing through it? So it is, uh, it's a really difficult question to answer how much is in the Thames, partly because it's not all moving from straight through. There's tidal areas pushing plastic back and forth, and also so much of it buried deep in the sediment. But we know that in three months of sampling with these nets, which stationary bottom dwelling nets about knee high, eight and a half thousand pieces of plastic were collected. And that means that these were pieces rolling along the riverbed, almost a river of plastic within the River Thames itself. So we know that there is clearly a huge quantity of plastic, but quantifying the exact amount is something that's really difficult to sort of do. Yeah, I guess it's, you know, do, do we have boats that kind of go up and down bringing some of that stuff up? So the Port of London Authority has these passive driftwood collectors. So they're not boats per se, but they are sort of moored, as the name suggests, were addition, uh, initially done to collect driftwood floating in the river to remove things that could damage ships and vessels going up and down. But now, as you can see from this image, it's sort of collecting a lot more plastic litter than it is driftwood. So hundreds of bottles collected probably by these driftwood collectors. Um, lots of it's washed along the shore. So Thames 21, a charity, uh, constantly monitoring and collecting litter from the river. Um, so really, we do know that there is a lot there. It's just as soon as you move, remove some, there's more. So quantifying it becomes... And it, yeah, it keeps. I guess it keeps more and more keeps coming in as you as you start to remove it. But how's how's it getting there? Because you know, I'm, I'm thinking about you know myself, and I'm sure many of our viewers watching this think, well, I'm you know I, I recycle my plastic where I can. I put it in my recycle bin. It gets collected by the council, uh, or if it's if it can't be recycled, it, it will go to landfill. So the fact that a lot of it seems to be getting into rivers and then ultimately out to sea, wh why is that happening? I think in some cases it's mismanaged waste. So it's either people littering, which um, I'm sure is a, a minority of people that would actually litter, but in some cases it's what we'd call accidental littering. So having a coffee cup on your way to work, the bin's a bit full, so you either put it next to it or squeeze it in. And it doesn't take a lot for an overfull bin to sort of leak some of that plastic out into the environment to go down the drain. Mm. Other bits are people... Um, flushing things down the toilet, for instance, that is a huge source of waste in the Thames. So wet wipes, sanitary products, cotton, uh, cotton buds are some of the most common items. And the only way they really could have got into the river is if somebody flushed them down the toilet, used that as a bin. Um, mm. Also, unfortunately, the system we've got, the sort of sewer system, is a Victorian system. And what 
the number of people, the population using it is far in excess of what it was designed for. So heavy rain can cause sort of untreated raw sewage to enter the river. So there are many ways that this plastic can get in, uh, runoff from landfill even. So it's not always the case that some one person threw that plastic into the river, but you know, a, a complex network of pathways. Yeah, and I guess in a city like London, you know, a very old city, its sewer system was never designed for the city at the size that it is now. Um, and that that in itself must create some problems as well with with waste getting into the into the waterways. Yeah. So anytime it rains, most uh, sewer treatment systems will have sort of swimming pools that fill up because they can only process water and waste at a certain rate. So while there's too much coming in, they'll sort of store it until a time when there's less rain and it can be processed. But there's only space to have so many of these. And if rain is not even necessarily very heavy, but just persistent, it, it sometimes just has to be released. There just isn't storage to hold it. But the Thames Tideways Tunnel is being produced and that will increase the capacity of the sewage system. So it'll be really interesting to see what impact, presumably a really positive one, but how positive. Uh, it'll be really interesting to see once it's it will, yeah. up and running. See if that does result in a reduction in the amount of plastic going in. Now, you know, we've we've already talked about things like plastic bottles and, and wet wipes and stuff as kind of classic examples, but what are some of the other kind of main sources of plastic that, that we kind of encounter in the river? So a lot of it is uh, single-use plastic, as you can see from these images. So food packaging, sort of crisp packets, chocolate bars, also coffee cups. So um, lots of plastic cups and lids, carrier bags, sanitary products, and also cigarette wrappers. So not just the cardboard, but sort of laminated card packets, but also that cellophane wrapper that en encases them. And these are some of the most common items we're finding, mostly in the riverbed, sort of as you can mm. see, quite muddy, quite caked in sediment. Some of them can be there for a really long time. And of course, a lot of the stuff that we can see in these images, uh, one of the things that will strike a lot of our viewers, I'm sure, is that this is stuff that's been used once and then thrown away. And of course, you know, it, it's very easy for us in a talk like this to kind of demonize plastic and say it's, you know, it's an awful thing, look what it's doing to the environment. But actually, um, you know, it, it's, it's an incredibly useful material that we use for, uh, you know, I could you could be here forever naming all the different things we use plastic for. But I guess there's a big difference between using plastic for things in our life that are useful versus you creating things out of plastic that you only use once and you throw away. Um, and everything we can see in the pictures there is an example of that single use plastic, which is a big part of the problem, isn't it? Yeah, so I mean, obviously plastic is fantastic and I'd never say that plastic in all instances is bad. I mean look at the current situation. The NHS uses single-use plastic all the time and think of how much benefit that brings and how amazing a product it is. But it's when systems like that obviously have very clear waste management in place and that plastic doesn't leak out into the system. It's, it's all this single-use plastic that we as the public tend to use that's much harder for us to mm. sort of control. And it's things like this food packaging and single-use plastics that we produce and, and use that ends up in the system. And so it really falls sometimes to the public to really sort of look at their uses and really consider what plastic is essential. Right. Now, microplastics is something that you, you mentioned specifically because the plastics that we've been looking at are quite, they're quite big, but it keeps breaking down and it keeps getting smaller and smaller. And eventually you get this, what you call microplastic. What exactly qualifies as a microplastic? Because this is a big source of the problems we're finding isn't it yeah so microplastics are anything that's smaller than five millimeters and a really easy way to picture this is to just think of anything that's smaller than a grain of rice say and so these plastics are obviously five millimeters or less means that they could go to incredibly small scales but it means that a lot of animals can eat them either because they can't see them or because they look like their food they can be in a very, really diverse range of colors and shapes so you saw some fibers, now you can see a film, so a piece of red and blue material. And so it could be fragments of carrier bags, for instance, or items from our clothes. And obviously a couple of years ago, microbeads were the sort of big microplastic that we all hated, but have since been yeah. banned. So really diverse range, even on such a small scale. And as well as breaking up, which we can see they're getting smaller and smaller, um, it, it changes as well as other changes that happen to the plastic that can add even more problems to the environment isn't there 
So all of these plastics contain chemicals, so dyes, flame retardants, things that make it rigid or flexible, depending on what this material was used for. Um, and also once they enter the environment, there's chemicals in the water that they're hydrophobic, which means they dislike water. And so they find plastic a really good surface to adhere to, to cling to, and they become very concentrated chemical pellets. And there's a, a question about whether these chemicals in the plastic and sort of adhered to them, whether they increase the exposure and risks to the animals that eat them. Right. Now, we've got we've got some images of, of some plastic that uh, you and your colleagues have actually collected, and we can see quite the transformation that happens. So people will instantly recognise what this is. Um, now, I always thought they were brightly coloured uh, packets of crisps here, but uh, all that that uh, pigment has has gone um, and presumably that pigment is a chemical that's now seeped into the environment. Exactly so this you can see that this is quite a well intact piece of plastic um, and you might not be able to make out but the best before date on this packet is about 86 so it's a, a 30 year old crisp packet and in 30 years a lot has happened to it whether it was in the Thames for 30 years or whether it's been for a variety of systems we don't know but all of that red dye has, has leached and that could have any number of effects um, depending on what that chemical makeup is. It could be that it is carcinogenic. It could be endocrine disrupting, which means mimicking hormones. So um, maybe it's estrogen like and therefore reduces the reproductive success of males. And so that chemical is now in the river. It could be adhered to other things. It could be in the stomach of animals having a really big effect on them. Mm, yeah and this, this is just one example there'll be many more uh, i'm sure and in fact i'm sure some some members of our, our audience might recognize some of these things uh, that we can we can see here but that that color pigment um for example here on this packet of crisps you can see it's sort of halfway there it's it's fading away um there's a a, a question uh, come through does does that mean if this is all seeping into the environment that we're actually eating some of this stuff ourselves so we are almost certainly eating plastic, whether it comes from the food, like the seafood that we eat is questionable. So with fish, we gut most of the fish we eat. So obviously that would directly remove the plastics. It would leave the chemicals that were in the tissue, but it would remove the sort of plastic itself. But actually we're surrounded by plastics. Um, furniture, carpets, clothes, they're all made of plastic fibres. And those are constantly shedding. Every time you move, you sit on a sofa, you're disrupting it, you're sort of putting those fibres into the air. And in fact, the amount of time it would take you to eat a plate of mussels, an animal that's well known to be contaminated by plastics, mm. more plastic would have sort of fallen onto that food from your house, from the fibres in the air, than whatever in it. So whilst, yes, we are almost certainly eating and inhaling plastics, we can't really blame the mussels or the fish for that. It is our environment. Yeah, it's uh, it comes back to us in the end, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, and I guess that this is. It sounds like this is sort of an area that's going to be researched going forward for for years and years as we become more aware of of, of, of what we've been doing um, uh, over the last few years. Um, excellent. Well, thank you guys for your questions so far. If you've got any more questions you would like to, to send through to Alex, please just send them through and we'll get through as many of them as we can. It's definitely a topic that I'm sure many people have thoughts and uh, you know do, do share if you've got any uh, ideas of your own, uh, what you think about the topic, let us know uh, and we'll, we'll answer those questions as, as we go. Uh, so uh, talking about um, uh, the River Thames, now I think a lot of people might think that the river is actually quite badly polluted. Um, is that actually the case? So the pollution in the Thames really depends how you look at it. So chemically, the river is the cleanest it has ever been. It was devoid of life at least twice, which meant there were no fish in the river. And that was due to really high chemical concentrations. My supervisor remembers that when he was a, a young boy, if you fell in the river, you'd get your stomach pumped. And that is something that you can say wouldn't happen today. The river is much cleaner with the use of digital cameras, of changes in x-rays, we're no longer using chemicals like silver nitrate, and that reduces the amount of chemicals in the river. But when it comes to plastics, there's a question of, we've not monitored plastics for very long. So in that sense, is the river more contaminated than it was in the past? Right. But it is a healthy river. It supports a wide range of life. So 
In the estuary alone, so just in the tidal reach, there's 125 species of fish. There's shrimp and small crustaceans, worms and all sorts of animals living in the sediment, as well as large megafauna, so seals, porpoises and dolphins that live and breed in the Thames. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I guess in some ways that's a really positive thing to hear that the river, if we put the plastic issue aside, if only we could do that, um, that it's it's relatively speaking quite a clean, quite a clean river. Um, so we've got a few questions coming through. Let's uh, let's answer some of them now. Um, so thank you guys for your question. Keep them coming. Um, so the first one here is you hear a lot about biodegradable plastics. Are they safe for the environment? I would always steer in the sort of air on the side of caution when it comes to biodegradable or compostable plastics. So biodegradable would mean it breaks down naturally, uh, whereas compostable obviously means it has to be chemically treated or heated. So it has to be composted in industrial waste systems. But I really would question whether they would degrade in the river. So the conditions under which they were tested in the lab is almost certainly much more favourable to the decomposition than would be in the River Thames. So they're probably not safe for the environment if they were to go there untreated. Um, I can't really say production wise whether they're better for the environment in terms of materials used or energy and other mm. aspects like that. Um, but I think while these technologies are being developed, it's obviously a positive sign that we're going in the right direction. We're trying to make a change. And it is through industry and through manufacture that will eventually find products that are suitable and last and durable, but also don't damage the system. Yeah, no, I guess that is something I, I remember I've. I put my um my food waste in a, a biodegradable compostable bag and um I put that in my compost bin and you know that that should be good conditions you would think uh for that to biodegrade but it still took quite a long time for that to break down um and you know when we're thinking about the impact this might have on animals it could still be a risk to animals for, for a long time time yeah. after so yeah definitely something to to be aware of uh, another question that's come through, uh, how does the Thames compare with other rivers in the world for plastic pollution? So it sounds Obviously like it might not be the worst, I don't know. It's not the worst. Um, we're certainly really lucky in that we're a very well-developed nation. We've got a very good sewage system in place. Obviously, there are instances where waste leaks out of that system for whatever reason, but um, the are certain rivers that are more contaminated than others definitely i think there's 10 rivers that equate to about 70 percent of all plastic waste in rivers and the thames is not one of those so you can say that we are certainly a lot cleaner but some studies have found that potentially microplastic levels are higher in some uk rivers than even in the great pacific garbage patch for instance so mm. It's not to say that they're not contaminated. It's just to say that we've maybe got a better sort of system in place to help prevent it. Yeah, and I guess you talked there about the microplastics. That's the pollution that we can't easily see. That's not your floating bottle that's drifting down the river. That's obvious plastic pollution. This is stuff that is almost invisible uh, when you're when you're looking at the environment. Now, of course, the animals that live in the uh, in that river. Uh, they must be ingesting this microplastic, not intentionally, of course. It'll be, uh, it'll, they'll not, they'll not be able to avoid it. I assume. What effect does eating these tiny bits of plastic have on on fish like the ones we can see here? So it's really going to depend on the animal that ingests the plastic, as well as the shape and type of material that it's ingesting. So. A lot of tests initially were done with microbeads, so these spheres that you know were in chemical, uh, in com uh, cosmetics and in toothpaste, and the effect that they have completely differs to the effect that things like fibers can have. So there's evidence that maybe fibers are worse for animals than these microbeads, and obviously if you've got fragment with rough edges, it's more likely to be abrasive and to damage the digestive tract, and also the animal ingesting it has this huge effect. So. With the fish, we're finding about three to four plastic fibres on average in each animal. Whereas when we look at crabs, they have really dense tangles of plastic, some of them over 100 fibres that completely fill the stomach. And in instances like that, that's obviously going to lead to potentially reduced feeding. If your stomach is full of plastic, you really don't want to eat. It's like saying you've had a big lunch and it comes to dinner. 
you're not as hungry as you would have been. Of so course, yeah. that will have knock on effects for your growth, for your energy stores and your ability to reproduce. And again, this is stuff that won't be immediately obvious if you, you know, you look at, you know, you might see lots of fish in the river and think, oh, it's actually not too bad. It's like, no, but you can't see the the invisible effect that that microplastic accumulation is having on their ability to grow, to thrive, to reproduce. Yeah. So for most plastic at present concentrations, as far as we know, in most systems, it's non-lethal. So it doesn't have a fatal impact on these animals. But this sort of, as you say, hidden growth impact or reproductive output is something that isn't immediately obvious and especially with so many other factors in the environment ocean acidification as we were saying overfishing temperature changes it's really hard to underpin on a population in the environment which combination is the most uh, lethal or most impactful fantastic excellent uh, well let's uh, let's talk a little bit about your your phd because you're a phd student at the museum so the one of many people are doing the research uh, using our collections and our and our labs to to help you um what uh, what exactly is it that you're trying to to address in relation to this issue of plastic in in the environment so my previous research focused almost solely on fish and that's why i've, I've spoken quite a lot about fish but my present research is now looking at, can we expand that system? Can we look beyond those animals and look at what those fish are eating and what eats those fish and see whether there is a movement of plastic, whether, as we can see in chemicals like DDT, is there a bioaccumulation, this increased concentration in the top of the food chain? So the, the seals, for instance, in the Thames, but to look at whether plastic moves from prey to predators or if if that isn't the case, does the plastic change in what animals are likely to eat? Would a, a shrimp eat something completely different to a fish due to the way it feeds or what it feeds on and how each animal is affected differently by plastic? Right. So it's at the core of this is looking at, you know, animals are consuming this plastic, but then other animals are eating them. Uh, so we can see here the kind of material that they might be encountering it's you know it's really horrible to think that this stuff is is building up inside the stomachs of of small fish but you know the fish are eating smaller animals and the fish themselves are being eaten by bigger animals and because as you said earlier the plastic never it doesn't break down it just gets well it, it doesn't go away anywhere it just gets smaller and smaller so are we seeing this accumulation of more and more tiny fragments of plastic in the larger animals that we find in the river so there's evidence that it might that definitely transfer. So if you feed a, a crab, for instance, a contaminated mussel, the plastics will definitely transfer. But the issue we've got is that retention time, the amount of time plastic stays in each animal differs. So for the fish, it doesn't appear to be any longer than food would traditionally stay in, in the stomach. So it seems that fish are maybe a less important part of this pathway. Whereas with the crabs, as I mentioned, their stomachs were completely full of plastic. And that means it's too big to pass out through the intestine. So that tangular plastic we saw previously, that came from the stomach of a crab. And hundreds of fibres, balloon fragments, carrier bag fragments, elastic bands, all mean that that clump will stay around for a long time. And so if anything eats like crabs, seabirds or seals, for instance, they will definitely have a very quick concentrated dose of plastic right yeah and you've you've you yourself have actually had an opportunity haven't you to to examine some of these top predators like the seals for example we've, we've got an image we can show you of, of one of the animals you've looked at just a, a warning it is an image of a dead seal so if you if you don't want to look at that um look away but it, it's you know this is this an example of an animal that is suffering the effects of this accumulation of plastic in the river so this is one of three seals, uh, three grey seals that we've looked at. Um, we do this in collaboration with Institute of Zoology at ZSL. So they have a cetacean stranding investigation program. So all of these were animals that either died in the river and washed ashore or died on shore. And uh, ZSL performed necropsies, determined cause of death for these animals. And we then take samples to look at the plastic that they've eaten. We can say that of the three seals we've looked at, none of them had large items of litter, which is a really good sign. None of them have swallowed a carrier bag, which would obviously have a really dramatic effect on their health. But what we can say is that there is evidence that microplastic is in these animals. We're still ongoing in our research, so we can't quantify that just yet. We're still in the process of doing that. 
But as part of this stranding network, we've also looked at a turtle that stranded in, in Blackwater and uh, three of the whales that stranded in the Thames at the end of last year. So we are really trying to understand the sort of breadth of the animals affected. Great. OK, now we have, we've had a few more questions come through. Thank you very much, guys, for them. Uh, do keep them coming. If you've got any more, send them through. We'll try and get through them all if we can. Uh, so this question is asking, uh, is there an animal that can digest plastic? I guess that's like the ultimate thing. If, if life adapts to this plastic being in the environment, is there anything, any animal that can digest plastic? So plastic is, because uh, it's non-organic, it won't digest. So no animal that I know of can process it. I have heard of studies looking at bacteria that can break it down in a lab, but obviously nothing in the environment has evolved to, to eat it. Um, I think we're looking at such a dra dr dramatic, rapid increase in the amount of plastic, and it's on such a short evolutionary time scale that you know nothing can have time to adapt to eat it because it just it's growing so quickly and it's not mm. enough time for these animals to evolve. Of course, I guess the closest thing to to that might be there's been some research into bacteria that might break down plastic um so that's that's an interesting area of study of course the immediate thing is you know as we were saying earlier not all plastic is bad so you can imagine if um if there was something that could eat it um if that bacteria for example got out into the into the wild suddenly all this important plastic that we actually need um might start to degrade so there would be could be problems there yeah so i definitely think it's like that if we do develop a technology or a bacteria that can treat plastic and break it up we do have to be really careful it, obviously it's not going to be something that's just let's put it all into the rivers and that will clean the rivers because in many of these situations yes it will eat plastic but if you give it something better to eat it's like more nutritious it might favor that so this will be bacteria in a lab condition chemically or whatever breaking mm. down plastic in a sort of industrial facility rather than a solution to what's already in the ocean yeah, no, some definitely things to think about there for, for sure. Uh, another question comes through, um, which is quite an interesting thing. Are all fish affected by plastic? Is this something that is is just universal um, or is it is localised to particular species? So as far as I know, pretty much every animal on the planet will eat plastic at some point. Um, some animals are better adapted. So some sea stars, for instance, can detect plastic and spit it back out. But there will be some instances where it's got a biofilm, some bacteria or something on it, something organic that sort of confuses them to eat it. Mm. Um, not all fish will be infected at the same time. So initially in the study that I did as an undergraduate, we found that 75% of flounder have plastic in the stomach. But just a year later, looking at a wider range of species, it went down to only 28%. So as I said, plastic in fish particularly seems to only stay around for about the same amount of time as food. Say it takes 24 hours to you know, digest your food and to excrete it in your feces. Plastic will fluctuate day to day, which animals are affected and how much. Right. And so for fish particularly, it's about 36%, 33%, a third of fish at any given time usually have plastic in them yeah it's a huge huge number especially when you if you start scaling that up around the the whole world you know it's 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 almost mind-boggling um so we've got now this is a really interesting question that's come through um about using the museum collections could you look at the stomach contents of old wet specimens in the nhm's collections so that's specimens preserved in uh, in alcohol uh could you look at those to see the plastic content or would the preservation fluid have dissolved it? So I doubt the fluid would have dissolved the plastic or it might have degraded it. So it might make it harder for us to determine chemically what it was. So we do have a machine that can tell us which is a polyamide and which is a polyester, for instance. So it might make that a bit more difficult, but we would be able to have some indication of what plastic uh, was in them. So there was a I know of a PhD student that looked at historic records of sea stars in Scotland and looked at these deep sea brittle stars and deep sea invertebrates. You could look historically at the plastic that was in them. And that definitely would be something that's really interesting to do with the museum collections. You've always just got to be a little bit cautious about contamination. So, as I said, plastic is 
absolutely everywhere it is in our homes in the air as we speak just surrounding us we do have to be a little bit cautious about these animals were preserved in mind of keeping the animal safe not in mind of preventing plastic so i think it would be a really interesting topic to do we've just got to be a little bit cautious that we sort of acknowledge that there is that potential contamination so to not take it with a grain of salt but not a piece of plastic yes <laughs> <laughs> um excellent thank you um okay well before we wrap up um you know it, it, it's very easy to get very depressed about a topic like this because it is a huge problem uh, that's affecting not only the river thames here in london but around the world and it is very easy to get a bit down about it but are there any plans uh, are there any projects underway at the moment that are uh, helping to clean up uh, the river thames so uh, as i mentioned the port of london authority has its driftwood collectors so they are constantly removing plastic from the river they are constantly emptying those and letting disposing of that plastic appropriately. Thames 21, an environmental charity in the area, is looking at what washes along the shore and they do regular beach cleans. So if anybody is interested in getting out and doing their bit, obviously once we're allowed out again, um, Thames 21 is a great place to go for sort of local beach cleans, to look at wet wipes, look at water bottles, look at all sorts of different uh, things all along the River Thames. Um, I know there's other groups as well so i think some organizations are building other sort of passive pollution collectors and um, so it is something that people are doing and obviously it doesn't take a you don't need to be an environmental charity or to be the port of london authority you could every time you walk your dog if you're walking along the river simply just pick up any litter you see so it could be as small as picking up one piece of litter every walk so i think it is something that we can tackle Absolutely. And it's good to know that, you know, the small things that individuals can do, because it's it's just easy to think it's too big a problem. I can't deal with it. But if, if each person does uh, a tiny little thing, uh, then the, hopefully the cumulative effect of that uh, will certainly help the situation, if not completely eradicate it, of course. Yeah, definitely. I mean, getting the stuff out of the actual river, once it's in the riverbed, it's going to be much harder. But definitely removing the stuff on the foreshore, the stuff that we can see is only going to be positive. There's no way that that is, is negative. And I really want to highlight that it feels like your little action, you switching to a reusable coffee cup might not do anything. But if you just think about how many coffee cups you would have drunk otherwise, you know, it scales up really quickly and every person mm. can have a huge impact by small actions. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you very much, Alex, for joining us today. We've we've run out of time, but it's been really interesting hearing about your research and and for highlighting to people uh, this huge this huge issue. So hopefully, in the weeks, months, and and years to come, we're going to be able to get get more of a handle on this and and hopefully uh, transform not only the River Thames but uh, rivers around the world and uh, and the oceans as well. So thank you very much for talking to us today, and all the best with uh, the rest of your research. Thank you. Excellent. And thank you guys as well for all of your questions and for tuning in. It's uh, great to see you. And, uh, you know, we produce these shows for you guys. Uh, it's great to have your questions um, and we're always happy to answer them. Uh, these Nature Life online programs will take place on Tuesdays and Fridays. So do keep an eye out for the announcements. It's a different speaker and a different topic each day. So uh, do tune in and have your questions ready. Our next talk uh, is going to be very, very different. We're going to be joining one of our curators uh, to talk about fossil ammonites, those uh, iconic spiral fossils found in rocks all over the world. So uh, if you're a budding paleontologist, uh, bring along your questions and you can speak to one of our curators there. But uh, please uh, join me now in thanking uh, Alex and uh, everyone behind the scenes that makes these shows happen. Uh, it's uh, great to, to run them, be able to offer them to you guys during this really strange time that we, we find ourselves in. But uh, thank you, Alex. Thank you guys for your questions. And we'll see you all again next time. Thank you.